this is sort of the problem of talking about secrets is people have amazing ways of changing the topic or taking out the emotional energy from things. That's a challenge. So I'll try to call that out first and then maybe there's some space. This is uh, someone from Australia, I think. Someone who works with borderline BPDs, so he knows a lot of nuances of working with shame. Not this guy. It'll be another guy. Though this guy's pretty good too. <laughs> Psychoeducation can be, I think, often a false therapy. It makes the therapist often feel better than the client. The big danger here, and I think this is very rife at the moment, is that we can teach people into feeling better. And I think that's bullshit. So if I talk about family secrets and silencing and fog and I teach you how to feel better or you take it and hear how to feel better, how to do better, that is counterproductive because it keeps the secrets going around. And that's sort of the thing that happened in person. We played the Jared Carmichael video and then people were hearing it as educational where it was a personal story that was being shared. So sometimes one of the defenses people have if they've grown up in family secrets is they need to cue in on anything that's said, interpret it of how they can perform better. How does this story, how does my story, how do I take it and tweak my performance? Because performing keeps the secrets going and makes me safe. So there's a filter of uh, an autopilot of constantly changing everything. So psychoeducation sort of is a way we sort of distract from witnessing. Particularly for this clientele. It doesn't mean there isn't a place for psychoeducation, but psychoeducation can be, I think, often a false therapy. It makes the therapist often feel better than the client. And then the client's in a position of having to either reject the psychoed or feel completely unheard and unresponded to or compliantly agree, in which case you have a pretend relationship. A pretend relationship. So this is a challenge of wounded healers. You'll find a wounded healer that speaks your language. You know, oh my God, this person knows my wound and this teaching fits perfectly. I'm going to get one-on-one -on -one coaching. And then finally you share your trauma that's different than the wounded healer. And then they flood you and destroy you and you have to act like you're a good student or whatnot. The secret continues because a lot of the psychoeducation is for the teacher, not for you. Teacher first or when they're triggered. If they're not triggered, they can pay attention to you. But if they're triggered, everything goes out the window. We need to not collude with hiding because hiding is a big part of the shame response. And So that's the issue. You can hide behind psychoeducation. It's a flavor of intellectualization. But it's accepted. That's the way we sort of soothe each other, give each other's tips, give each other's cookies pat on the back. That's acceptable, but that's a way to not show your genuine reaction. It's a way to not show your confusion, so you give these psychoeducational type responses. It's a safe response, but it's not... It's guarded. Maybe it's just guarded. It's masked. And I think uh, self-hate leads to a lot of hiding. What are the signs of hiding? Well, there are Obvious signs of shame, gaze averted, uh, hunching, soft voice, silence, etc. But there are less obvious signs of shame, uh, avoiding subjects, intellectualizing, attacking, getting angry, etc. They've adapted uh, so they don't look ashamed. We often don't see it, so you have to guess. The most important thing, I think, is to create the space where we allow a safety 
for them to be able to present what is personal to themselves and for us to receive that and respond to that in a way that recognises that. This is extremely difficult because a lot is hidden. So this is my slower approach for the Zoom meeting because in person, maybe I've flooded or the person is already flooded. So then I had to backtrack and create space. Or I had to add humor or go sideways to introduce a topic. Because once people are flooded and triggered, they become more uh, defensive. Or Sarah Ness would say... Because when we're triggered, we can't think, we can't consider. Because when we're triggered, we can't think, we can't consider. Because when we're triggered, we can't think, we can't consider. Because when we're triggered... We... But the downside is if you always talk like this and you're slow, it's kind of boring and slow and whatever. But <laughs> There's a balance between talking about stuff too intensely and also giving some space and some pace to try to invite people to join and, and share stuff. Encourage, but don't push. And be aware of subtle disjunctions and invite exploration. See there? So be aware of subtle disjunctions. So if you see someone re reflect back to you in a slight way off or defense, the subtle differences, that's a clue. There's some shame triggers coming. And it's hard for therapists and coaches to do this. I, I guess it's impossible for codependents. So ignore that advice. You don't need to worry about subtle disjunctions. It's impossible. You're not going to see. And repair. Encourage, but don't push. Invite exploration and repair. Be wary of big positive words like proud of yourself. My client, D, she had done something that I thought was amazing. I said, you must be proud of yourself. And she said... So he thought it was amazing, but he overstepped. How did you overstep? Stud a wretch in front of me. It was way too far for where she lives in her self-hatred, even though she was a lot better and had done something really amazing, this was unacceptable. She couldn't take it in and she literally started to rich. So if you can give them affirmations or I'm proud of you, and if they're reflecting and going inside about shame or frustration, you're sharing a dissonance And this is what happens in the real world, which frustrates me. When I try to share something that's unique and not people will try to rush and give a hero cheerleading type nonsense. And that's not the space I want to go to. So I usually just don't respond. <laughs> but when I don't respond, I'll, some people get aggressive. <laughs> they get judgmental. Like, oh, why don't you thank in the compliment and the encouragement? Why aren't you happy? the sort of shared uh, judgment of, of liked emotions or something, I'm not sure. So this example was um, a bit dry. It wasn't a good uh, role play, so I'm going to give you a model of how distractions look. But I'll introduce it first by asking if anybody... Uh, really likes Steven Pinker and thinks he's a, worth, the best person in the world. Are there any giant fans of St Steven Pinker? In here? Never heard of him. Okay. Never good. heard of him. Okay. Cause My first time. Some people really, really love him, and then if I share this and criticize him, I'll face the wrath of S Steven Pinker fans. He's like a really optimistic uh prolific book writer who plays with words and I think he's quite devious but that's my opinion so it's good you guys haven't seen him so you can look at this video and give me a, a genuine read of what you take about him Steven Pinker author of like 10 books this is a way of how he distracts so that's the problem psychoeducation is a way to distract or intellectualize Aphorisms is also a way to distract and intellectualize. The problem with an aphorism is that it makes you forget what the original <laughs> point was. <laughs> and then I just want to caution against um, 
I think that it was that much better in the past. I mean, my, one of my favorite okay. quotes is that uh, the, the best explanation for the good old days is a bad memory. The problem with an aphorism is that it makes you forget what the original <laughs> point was. So you wanted to caution, and then what was the aphorism, aphorism <laughs> that you just threw in there? Is that uh, the, the best explanation for the good old days is a bad memory? The best explanation for something is a bad memory. So throws that in real quick. So then you have to mentally try to catch up. Then you jump somewhere else. <laughs> but the problem with the aphorism is that the problem with an aphorism is that it makes you forget what the original <laughs> point was. <laughs> and he's almost laughing shamelessly. So in other words, so, we're jumping around. Is that right? It's a way of jumping around, but it's a way of like uh, red herring. That would be the technical term. So if you want to jump to a different sandbox or topic, you need to cover your tracks. So you throw in an aphorism or a teaching or some joke or something to sort of distract. So it's not exactly word salad. So you need some sort of intermediary type transition vehicle, a teaching, an injunction, uh, tone policing, then you jump to another box. So that's sort of the, how he's owning, he's using aphorisms where he even gets lost. So there's a few more, so track, feel his energy and or just try to track him. <laughs> and this includes, by the way, the New York Times. And there is a sort of subversive book by Ashley Rinsberg came out a couple of weeks ago called The Grey Lady Linked, going over the history of the New York Times coverage of world events, which uh, f forget all the news that's fit to, to print. They downplayed the Holodomor, the uh, terror mm -hmm. famine in Ukraine under Stalin. Their Berlin uh, chief during the 1930s was a Nazi who constantly apologized for the Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. So this is showing off how smart he is to memorize some facts, but it's also mentally stressing you to keep up with all these details, which might or might not make any difference. <laughs> Another way of intellectualizing, throw in little details here and there, and that stretches the emotion. The coverage of Fidel Castro in the 50s amplified the strength of the guerrilla movement, the weakness of the mm. Mo Dinh Diem regime in South Vietnam leading to the CIA-inspired coup may have been inflated by New York Times coverage. There's actually okay. a history of activism. The problem with an aphorism is that it makes you forget what the original <laughs> point was. <laughs> Does anyone remember where he started? <laughs> Something about reading a book from New York Times. So this is just one. Then he jumps to another point. <laughs> and here's another way of looking at it. Again, I don't want to be uh, to, to take on the optimist role too, too thoroughly because they're... which means he's going to. <laughs> I don't want to play optimist too much, but let me do it anyways. <laughs> Oops. Where was it? Was it here? <laughs> and here's another way of looking at it. Again, I don't want to be uh, to, to take on the optimist role too, too thoroughly because the, the, I agree with John. A lot has gone wrong in the last uh, 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 few years. The problem with an aphorism is that it makes you forget what the original <laughs> point was. <laughs> the constant vulnerability of the institutions of liberal democracy and um, uh, truth seeking. Yeah. Um, but um, did you see his eyes just then? Was Dave, going? sorry to interrupt. Did you see when he, he see how he did that to get attention with his eyes, and then drop? You see his back. eyes are darting because he's overactive. Yeah. But they're wide open when he makes that initial hit, and then close, it, and then they shrink down again, and he babbles on. There's a lot of weird eye movements. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. But the motive is I'm not sure, but this is. Uh, very unusual eye movements. Oh, see, he's a professor at Harvard. So now he's losing his point and he admits it. With this. The, um, the best explanation is a bad memory. Yeah. See, and then Jonathan Haidt remembered his <laughs> aphorism way back when. <laughs> That's where he sort of owns this duper's delight, right? Where did I start with this? Um, the best explanation is a bad memory. The best explanation is a bad memory. That's a simplification, I think, of that. So now he shares. Yes, right. Um, 
and the problem with an aphorism is that it makes you forget what the original <laughs> point was. <laughs> um, So he's owning that he's forgotten the aphorism, the point. So he's using an aphorism, aphorism to create a red herring to block you from following what the prior argument was. But it also helps him forget what the prior argument was or where he's going. Where was I going with this? Where was I going with this? Um, where was I going with this? And this is a Harvard professor of how many books or something? He was like one of the most influential people list or something. I would argue it seems like he grew up in family secrets. The way he's talking is his own agenda of trying to keep things optimistic. To block his own emotional secrets and flashbacks and grief. So he's been programmed to look towards the future or look towards something to not look at the shadows or the skeletons. And it's to the point where if anything you say triggers him, he's going to overrun what your voice is. He's going to de-voice you, ignore what you're saying, dismiss what you're saying, because protecting his mind from going back into the shadows or the secrets is more important. So this was from the whiteboard today. I don't think we formally covered it, so no need to memorize it. But fear, obligation, guilt is an acronym for FOG, emotional blackmail. And then I broke down uh, three flavors of it. So fear is more demeaning, dehumanizing, terrorism, dignity attacks. Obligation is where you feel trapped or overwhelmed or flooded. I can't get away. That's what obligation feels like. And then guilt is, I feel powerless. My, my tactics of defense aren't working. My tactics of navigating and knowing what's happening, I feel hopeless and, and powerless. Essentially, I'm devoiced. I don't know how to keep my voice in the interaction with the other person or the group. And why do we do these three things? Why does this come up across? Because these three elements or elements for suicidal ideation. So when you devoice or you're with someone in silencing secrets, they're using suicidal ODV, ostentatious displays of vulnerability. They're using that to motivate you because it's these subtle hits of um, suicide. I don't have that handy. Ostentatious displays of vulnerability. So memorize this and I'll show you what uh, suicide, three elements of suicide, and then we'll see if you can link this into how family secrets work. So let's make this a puzzle. Can you keep up and figure out how suicide and secrets and hidden suicide is how family secrets work. Attempts to try understand suicide have been done by psychologists. They found that you had to have three broad factors combined for someone to feel suicidal. They have to have a loss of social standing or a sense of defeat. We rank ourselves in society and when we go down the social standing, particularly precipitously and quickly, it's crushing, it's crushing. If you combine that... So number one, you have a devalue hit. He specifically said social standing hit. In narcissist, you would say narcissistic injury. In codependence, you might have threat of exile. Essentially, that's triggering a social fear by taking away your meaning and terrorizing you with the threat of social exile or a genuine reputation destruction where you're worried the group might turn on you, that's the terrorism. And the terrorism could be linked to dehumanization, dignity, hit, demeaning, destroy, 
it's triggering fear and it's genuine fear because your social status and your your bonds and connection that's important so number one in suicidal ideation or suicidal drives is uh, loss of social value I'm simplifying that to just terror social terror or family terror connection terror with an inability to escape that particular situation that's making you feel like that plus a feeling number two inability to escape that's where you feel trapped and overwhelmed where you feel flooded where you're obligated to stay around and you you're frozen yep. of general hopelessness that there is nothing you can do about anything in your life then it's very likely you will feel suicidal third one was genuine hopelessness if I guilt trip you or the group in the situation devoices you where you don't you can't keep up or you can't respond with your defenses or your identity you feel powerless or hopeless you get erased now for someone is acutely suicidal factors number two and three the inability to escape and the feeling of hopelessness are generally temporary when you manage someone who's acutely suicidal it's important to give them time as well as to give them help these things work um, also important is to help them solve the problems that led to that loss of social standing or that sense of defeat or being crushed positive support and view to the future help because it addresses the hopelessness so if you take them out of the trigger and you give them time and space that helps address the overwhelm and the powerlessness because with more time you can change your plan and with more time and space you can feel less overwhelmed and then for a lot of situations your social standing and whatnot that can be sorted out and slowly re be re rebuilt though it takes a lot of exposure to see how much your character destruction or reputation has been damaged that's part of the 30-day challenge i put the video out so the first couple several days i'm like what's the damage <laughs> what's the judgment so after two weeks no one cares <laughs> but then i'm still so it took time to sort of get through the terror of being exposed and erased and then slowly if i build my social standing or what my social status is on youtube is then the my terror of being demeaned and erased and devalued that might lighten or I can pivot and just build a brand off that. And with time, that'll change. So, for example, I saw a guy once he arrived intensely suicidal. He'd never been suicidal before in his life. He was in his mid-30s. He'd worked all of his adult life to build up a business for him and his family. And he got into financial problems and the business crashed and he owed a lot of money. He felt so ashamed about it, he couldn't tell his wife or his children about it. So now he was in a double bind. He lost his business, he lost everything that he looked forward to living, and he also felt increasingly isolated and uh, frightened of the shame, and so he couldn't talk. So he lost his business, so that's the fear. And then he couldn't talk because he was ashamed, so he couldn't, uh, he felt alone and isolated, so that's being trapped. And then without people to talk about it, in space and time, he felt powerless because his business collapsed and he felt ashamed with his family. He had two different identities. His family thought he was a successful business person, but the reality is his business fell apart and he was too ashamed to share it. So, so that's three elements that led to acute suicide. Or acute suicidal drives. To he anyone around him. Succeed. So the management for him was pretty simple. He came into hospital and he got time out. And over the next week, like on the first day he was there, he was dead set sure he was going to die. There was nothing he could do. There was nothing we could say that could change it. But by the end of the week, he was able to accept some help from one of our social workers to try and sort out his finances. And he was able to start to feel brave enough to address the shame that he was feeling and talk to his wife, who he thought would definitely reject him and make him feel worse. But actually, as it turned out, she was able to understand and help. And so so his I image was the wife would get angry or be shamed, but the actual conversation revealed that his social status, his fears were overblown. But until he had the space to get through the overwhelm and having time to talk it out, 
to see exactly how much social status was destroyed. He was still suicidal, but as uh, he worked through these three, lowering these three elements, he got out of the fog and the suicide eased. So that whole thing uh, started to become manageable. And then I followed him up about three weeks after that, and he had no suicidal thoughts at all. He still was struggling with a whole lot of things, but there was a sense that he could do something about it. Time itself is very important in acute suicidality because he's likely to find the ways to right himself and get back to where he was. There was a sense that he could do something about it. So that last part, there was a sense there's, that he could do something about it. Where he was. There was a sense that he could do something about it. So the opposite of suicidal drives might be agency. Feeling like you're an agent and you can navigate the world and there isn't all these giant uh, dangers. But I'm going to argue that suicidal ideation and these drives are linked to... Uh, signals, 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 ostentatious displays of vulnerability. Signals, ostentatious displays of vulnerability. So codependents can fall for the ostentatious display of vulnerability because you've grown up with family secrets. You've grown up with silencing, and when someone is has threatening that little suicidal loss, that's where you jump and you try to prevent it. You've been conditioned with fear, obligation, guilt. And then when this happens too much for you, you triggers your own suicidal ideation or depression. So you, you jump to rescue the other person's ostentatious displays of vulnerability. Mostly because you don't want to fall apart, but you like to think you're a good person and you'll rescue them from all the stuff. They know the trick and they're using this to trigger your <laughs> suicidal drives to make you jump. And that's where you feel resentful after the you get constantly triggered with ostentatious displays of vulnerability. Few minutes, a little more. So, is anyone following? <laughs> yes. Is anyone depressed? No. Yes. Hey, honesty. That's good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but if you break down depression, suicidal drives into just these three elements. And you manage them, create communities and friends to manage. You know, find your voice. So instead of trying to get more powerful and hold on to hope, find your creative voice. Find your free, your sad baby. That'd be my solution for guilt. If you feel trapped and overwhelmed a lot of that times where you can't escape, get used to being trapped. That's sort of counterintuitive. Maybe that was part of the after part of your package. You're trapping yourself in the, into an identity. If you realize that you're a process, you're a verb, you're part of flow, you're not trapped. You're in motion always. You just need to give it time and space and trap, being trapped is an illusion. Or you're trapped. You were trapped as a child. So someone triggers your flashback, you feel like you're trapped like a child, but now you have to look around and see, oh, I can, I can move, I can leave, I can change rooms, you're not trapped. So a lot of the trapped and overwhelmed is your own uh, flashbacks. So you got to update your map so you don't feel trapped. And then fear and terrorism, that's a, your social status. You've got to find your social place and social belonging. This is trickier. I'll try to address this by Act 3. A lot of it is, is partially true. I'll, I'll work on that. <laughs> so how to set up more stuff then? 
So how do I link this to family secrets or abuse or invisible abuse? Um, We'll see how this lands. This is Tara Westover. She wrote a memoir called Educated, which I think had some nice stories of uh, gaslighting, family abuse, and whatnot. It's strange how you give the people you love so much power over you. When my dad didn't believe me, they both announced that I was lying and ultimately possessed. And even then, there was a whole couple of year period, two years maybe, Sometimes I would think I was crazy. I really did. I just thought, well, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it wasn't so bad, and maybe, it, maybe it's okay, and I'm overreacting. And yes. I think I, I wrote it. It was a journal entry I wrote when I was 16, or I wrote, "It's strange how you give the people you love so much power over you." Yeah. I mean, I have a theory. I think all abuse is, is foremost an assault on the mind, and if someone's going to have an abusive relationship with you, they really have to invade your reality and they have to distort it. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a good point that abuse that sticks and abuse that's lingering, it's the abuse that invades your reality, that distorts your mind, that messes with your memories. It messes with your ability to navigate reality. Or it distorts your reality where you feel trapped when you aren't. <laughs> or it makes you feel hopeless and powerless because you've been devoiced your ability to state your truth and sort through reality by communicating your truths has been disarmed or disabled by being the voice. And then you've given up your power or you had your power taken away where other people are trapping you. They're setting up traps or even your head is setting up traps. Like it's either or this, there's no other choices. Both choices are double bind losses. All of that is the abuser or the cult or the group has invaded your reality and smoke and mirrors change things to make you feel trapped and powerless. And often they do that by giving you a physical or psychological hit of terrorism to demean you. That's the initial injury. And they have to change how you see yourself and, and, and what you think happened. And they have to have this almost kind of mind control. And my brother had that over me. Uh, I'd grown up in a household that had violence in it. And I'd had this relationship with him for many years. And it was, to an extent, normalized. It's strange how you give the people you love so much power over you. See, it's not that bad, that sort of mantra. Perfectly, yeah. You say that to yourself, other people say that to yourself. So that's killing your own judgment of saying, I hurt, or this is bad, or this is important. You're second guessing your judgment and giving your voice or allowing your voice to get stolen by the cult, by the leader, by the abuser, by the parent. That sort of abuse is, that's the abuse that lingers on and on and on because it's invisible. That's the sort of why gaslighting is so annoying. Um, so let's see. Okay, this is interesting. So this is how her brother, Sean, groomed one of her, uh, one of his early girlfriends. So this would be the example of somebody who's using gaslighting and distorting realities and showing how, how he thinks about it from Tara's point of view. So it's not, it's not Sean's story. It's Sean's story. It's not written by him. So it could be exaggerated or not. Sadie started dropping by the junkyard around quitting time, usually with a milkshake for Sean, or cookies or cake. Sean hardly even spoke to her, just grabbed whatever she brought him and kept walking toward the corral. So Sean is uh, Tara's brother who abused her multiple times. And then uh, Sadie is some girl who is hot on him. At the next rehearsal, Charles asked Sadie about a scene, and Sean saw them talking. Sadie came over a few minutes later, but Sean wouldn't speak to her. He turned his back, 
and she left crying. By the next rehearsal, a few days later, Sean seemed to have forgotten it. Sadie approached him warily, but he smiled at her, and a few minutes later they were talking and laughing. Sean asked her to cross the street and buy him a Snickers at the dime store. She seemed pleased that he would ask, and her... So this would be Sean groom, grooming her or testing her to see how groomable she is. So if you're a people pleaser and somebody who is a natural predator or programmer, groomer, they'll give you a test. They'll first ignore you. And if you over respond to the ignorance being ignored and you start chasing, they got you somewhat hooked. They'll reel you in and then they'll give you another test. What's the second test that Sean did for Sadie? Hurried out the door. But when she returned a few minutes later and gave him the bar, he said, What is this shit? I asked for a Milky Way. You didn't, she said. You said Snickers. I want a Milky Way. Sadie left again and fetched the Milky Way. She handed it to him with a nervous laugh, and Sean said, Where's my Snickers? What, you forgot again? You didn't want it, she said, her eyes shining like glass. She still has her voice right now. I heard this. <laughs> His tone is like, this is ultimate truth you did wrong. Who caves? This is sort of a, this wrestling match of whose reality, <laughs> whose opinion matters more. I gave it to Charles. Go get it. I'll buy you another. I want that one. Get it or don't come back. Get it or don't come back. So he actually wants her to embarrass herself to Charles and get the Snickers back. He doesn't really care about Snickers because she said she could buy it from the store. This is a battle of wills. It's not physical abuse yet, but this is how they're testing abusers. It's a power game and it's a shame game. And once you've been programmed by the subtle shame, then the physical shame could come later. And then you might beat yourself up and say, why did I see it coming? Well, it happened with the initial ignoring hit, I don't see you. And this is also, if you don't do this, I'm not going to see you again. So that's, I'm going to reject you by not seeing you as the motivator. Constantly. You're not important to me until you do something. And you're not important to me until you jump through A, B, C, D, E, hoops. A tear slid down Sadie's cheek, smearing her mascara. She paused for a moment to wipe it away and pull up her smile. Then she walked over to Charles and, laughing as if it were nothing, asked if she could have the Snickers. He reached into his pocket and pulled it out, then watched her walk back to Sean. Sadie placed the Snickers in his palm like a peace offering and waited, staring at the carpet. Sean pulled her onto his lap and ate the bar in three bites. You have lovely eyes, he said, just like a fish. Sean found out Sadie's class schedule and memorized it. He made a... So that's the first example the gaslighting between the Snickers and the Milky Way. ...point of driving to the high school several times a day, particularly at those times when he knew she'd be moving between buildings. He'd pull over on the highway and watch her from a distance, too far for her to come over, but not so far that she wouldn't see him. Until one day, when Sadie appeared on the steps of the high school with Charles. They were laughing together. Sadie hadn't noticed Sean's truck. I watched his face harden, then relax. He smiled at me. I have the perfect punishment. I simply won't see her. All I have to do is not see her, and she will suffer. Right there. Weaponized absence. All I have to do is not see you or threaten to reject you or ignore you, and then I'll make you jump. Once I program that with a look or some micro-expression, your behavior will do it without even thinking. I'll behaviorally condition you to jump on being ignored, the threat of not seeing you. He was right. When he didn't return her calls, Sadie became desperate. She told the boys at school not to walk with her for fear Sean would see, and when Sean said he disliked one of her friends, she stopped seeing them. Sadie came to our house every day after school, and I watched the Snickers incident play out over and over, in different forms, with different objects. Sean would ask for a glass of water. When Sadie brought it, he'd want ice. When she brought that, he'd ask for milk, then water again. Ice, no ice, then juice. This could go on for 30 minutes before, in a final test, he would ask for something we didn't have. Then Sadie would drive to town to buy it. Vanilla ice cream, fries, a burrito. Only to have him demand something else the moment she got back. 
All I have to do is not see her, and she will suffer. You incrementally groom and you just repeat as a cycle. It's not very hard from Sean's perspective. Does it look like he's using all kinds of energy on how to mess with her? So when we spend all this time trying to make up all these maps of abusers and abuse and red flags and we're intellectualizing, they're not, they don't have this gigantic map of how to manipulate you. Their tricks are rather easy. This is from Audiobook of Educated by Tara Westova. It's behaviorally conditioned, yeah, and ABA and behaviorally conditioned, uh, behavioral conditioning was a early, early form of psychology that's fallen out of favor. It's mostly used for special needs, uh, but it still works on humans, and it's intuitive and Sean would train horses and other animals. So he'd probably just use the same techniques that worked on horses <laughs> and use it on people. It's the same breaking a will, breaking spirit. Um, so what happens is that you get, um, you put the mask on. And the mask is somebody else defining everything for you. So then you have all these injuries and all you're doing is just hiding behind the mask. Or you don't even see what you see because it's your parents or your abuser that's telling you what's happening. So then you come to these groups and other things and you're looking for other people to validate your reality or validate you tell you what what you're seeing but you haven't learned how to see for yourself that's uh, that's the bigger challenge all you know is to silence yourself and eat your rage and eat your rage and once in a blue moon you blow up and then you feel ashamed because you couldn't control it. So let's go into some examples and see if this triggers anything. Or did I do enough setup to describe the dynamics? This is Amy Schumer and Oprah talking about uh, their past abuse or history with it. I got hurt by accident a lot. It was, he didn't realize how hard he grabbed me or shook me or pushed me. Yeah. And I would fall and hit something and then I'd be hurt. Um, carrying my shoes and running into backyards trying to get away from him because I was afraid for my life. Yeah, it's so out of body. You're like, oh, I'm not this woman. Who's this woman? Yeah. Why am I in this woman's body who's running from her boyfriend? This can't be me. This can't be me. This can't be me. When I grew up, I'd seen my cousin Alice being uh, beaten by a boyfriend who beat her regularly. And I was always, I was. Right there. This can't be me. This can't be me. When I so an abuser might say, this can't be me. This can't be me. That sort of self mantra is rejecting what's happening right now. It's a way of dissociating, which works in the short term. It helps you survive the incident, but it fragments your memory. It fragments yourself for the short term survival. And then if you overuse that crutch, this can't be me that's somebody else, then you're sort of creating a mass shield of saying this belief of who I want to be is me. And then you forget who you are because this, your defense ends up being counterproductive. I'll try to explain that more or hopefully we can give more examples. I grew up, I'd seen my cousin Alice 
being uh, beaten by her boyfriend who beat her regularly, and I was always, I will never be that woman. And I held right. myself superior to that. I'm not that I'm kind not of that, woman. I'm not, not that kind of woman. Yeah, then you realize that there is then, no kind of woman. There is no kind of woman. It's not. I'm not that kind of woman. That's not me. So this is now starting the issue of negative identity. Which I want to have a better pointer. <laughs> but we'll work with negative identity for now. Negative identity is when you have an identity that's saying, that's not me. Or I don't want to be that. Or never again. Or I don't like that. Your identity is based on some external stimulus and you respond in rejection. But if your identity is only negative identity, I want to avoid this sanction. I want to fit in by doing this or I don't want to be sadistic or whatever negative pointer you have of saying, that's not me, never again. Then you're living, you're driving with your rear view mirror. You're not driving towards a goal. You're driving through life in avoidance of not me, not this, never again. And you're hyper focused at avoiding that, that new thing, but you'll probably just run into another pothole or problem because you're not, you don't have a positive identity going towards something or you don't have your inner voice telling you what really gives you joy. All you have is your past fears and the abuser's injunctions and you either have follow orders or somehow reject what you think is bad and that's ends up being all, all of you. That's your identity. Your identity is and is an avoidance. It's a negative. It's a non-identity. So I have some more on that, but let's finish this book. You know, who we picture, who we picture. I think I had a really distinct picture of what I thought an abused woman looked like. I believe anytime you are suppressing any of yourself to try to put on the face, wear the mask for the way a man or a group of people want you to be, then you, you, that's abusive to you. Right. It's he, them breaking you down because yeah. they're afraid of losing you. Yeah. And it's yeah. about themselves, yes. you know, but he really had convinced me that I wasn't lovable and, and he was the only person that could ever possibly love me. So I better work it out with, with him. I'm so lucky to be with him. Right. And then again, I would feel bad for him after he hurt me, knowing how bad he would feel. She would get broken, and then she would feel bad for him. Is that like uh, lung cancer syndrome or whatever the way that you, you care for your abuser? But when you're broken down, and then now the abuser is also sharing their pain, it's easy to care for them because... Uh, you're broken down. You have no boundaries. So you're caring and then you care for them. Uh, if you were to hate them and judge them, Stockholm Syndrome, there, but that means you aren't broken down. <laughs> if you're broken down, then you don't see yourself. You and him are one. So his wounds you could care for. So if we, you're going to judge yourself after the Stockholm Syndrome and say, why did I care for him? <laughs> after I'm broken down, it, it it's stupid. And if you're broken down, then you're going to care for, you have no boundaries. So me and you and everything is, is one. So Boundaries are the realization where I stop and you begin. I stop and you begin. I stop and you begin. Boundaries are... And if your abuser is part of your world, the abuser is harming you. If you care for the abuser, they might be nice. So if you're broken, you've been broken down by the abuser, you and them are one. Especially if you're a child or it's a sibling or something, you're helpless. It makes sense to care for them. Then if you go to therapy or other people and say, why are you, they're going to judge you for that. is just messing with your head. You got to find yourself first and then some other stuff. <laughs> just rejecting and leaving, that's uh, too big of a jump. But negative identity, Bachman talks about it here. 
He talks about it from a narcissist standpoint, but I'd argue codependents might also have negative identity. Their sense of identity critically depends on rejecting people. It's a negative identity. Mm -hmm. they, they feel that they exist when they are not someone else. When they are not someone else. So a narcissist might reject somebody, but if you're rejecting your inner voice, you're rejecting your killer instinct, you're rejecting your rage, is also a negative identity. It doesn't have internal structures. Mm -hmm. There's emptiness there. It's an, an absence aspiring to become presence. It's an, an absence aspiring to become presence by rendering you an, an absence. Rendering you an, an absence. Mm. It's an emptiness that tries to transfer itself to you. Mm. I am empty. Mm. I feel that I don't exist. Tell me that I exist. Tell me that I'm a genius. Tell mm. me that I'm handsome. I need your testimony. I need your input to recreate myself on the fly. Right there. Tell me I exist. Transfer itself to you. Mm. I am empty. Mm. I feel that I don't exist. Tell me that I exist. Tell me that I'm a genius. Tell mm. me that I'm handsome. This is what I run into if I don't reward people for their worthless compliments. Their absence triggers them and then they start getting angry at me because I'm not validating that they exist, but it's not them that exists. That's a performance they're putting up for me. That's your fucking problem. But codependents and narcissists have negative identity. So their identity is in their mask and identity or their performance, their beliefs. And if I don't fit into their beliefs, I am a threat to their identity. I make them feel like they don't exist, but that's their, that's not my fault. But it ends up that way. I need your testimony. I need your input to recreate myself on the fly all the time, to recreate myself on the fly all the time. I am empty. Mm. I feel that I don't exist. Now, can you guys take this heavier reflection? <laughs> we walk around with all this unnamed pain that organize our lives in ways that makes it difficult for us to know why we do what we do. So this assaulted sense of self is what happens to one's self. Uh, when one's self has been traumatized, it's very difficult to define or develop a clear sense of who one is. Because oftentimes, that if one's experience is that of being defined, then our sense of self grows out of proving that we're not how we're defined. Right there. So, if your abuse is you've been defined by your abuser, and you spend your whole life trying to counter that definition, to say, I'm different this way, I spend my life in Western culture saying I'm not playing by this game and I get punished because <laughs> in Western culture there's little room for anybody outside of the norms. So then I waste my energy trying to say that's not me or fighting those defenses and it's easy to get lost in that. He's describing how marginalized races have to deal with this every day. But it's the same thing for abuse survivors, codependents. You learn that you have, you live your whole life trying to block definitions or define yourself in the face of pressure. Then all you know is negative identity. Who I am is not what it's not what I organically become. It's who I am is in response to how I'm defined. Who I am is in response to how I'm defined. So you're trying to do stiff arm, but you're also nice. So you have to do a stiff arm that's nice because you're a codependent people pleaser. So you got to push people back and then be nice. That's uh, impossible. <laughs> so if you can't push people back and say, that's not me, you got to be people pleasing. So you got to run and please them. There's no time for you to define your difference. There's no time for you to find your voice. There's no space. Our sense of self doesn't get to develop in quite the way organically as it should.
We walk around with all this unnamed pain. Who I am is in response to how I'm defined. Voicelessness. It doesn't mean that one doesn't have, that one lacks the ability for utterances and vocalizations, but rather has to do with advocacy, speaking up on one's behalf. When we are silent, we walk around with our organs carrying matter and mess that the human organs aren't meant to carry. And that's what I realized my father watching him there. All the stuff he's been carrying for decades of his life that he couldn't say. Decades. He had to be on his dying bed in a crazed state before he could say the things he needed to say to white people with white people not present. Rage, on the other hand, is much more primitive and occurs over a protracted period of time. So if you've been dominated, you've been dehumanized, and you've been degraded and devalued, you're going to have rage. To embrace so if you've been dominated, devalued, dehumanized, you're going to have rage. So if you've been demeaned and you've been constantly terrorized where you're living in fear, other people are defining you. It's not safe for you to have free expression. The natural response is rage. our rage and help our young people embrace their rage because I think that rage is like love. It's an energy source. When it's guided and directed, it allows us to reach the depths of our greatness. And when it's denied, it kills us. I'm hoping that when it's didn't when your rage is denied, it kills us. Depths of our greatness. And when it's denied, it kills us. I'm hoping that you'll be in touch with your rage, acknowledge it, because when you get in touch with your enrage, it can become outrage. And outrage doesn't mean it, that it has the power to destroy, but it also has the power to build. I can see that brick, you can use that brick to take it and put up somebody's head, or you can use that same brick to have the first step toward creating a path, uh, a bridge out of, out of the circumstances you're in. That's how, you have that. This is an amazing metaphor. You can use a brick to break somebody's head. <laughs> or you can use a brick to build a bridge. <laughs> This is the best metaphor you could build, but <laughs> but if you share your outrage and your rage, then now you can get to your unexpressed pain. <laughs> but right now, because you've been devoiced and silenced, you've been demeaned, and you've been fear, obligation, guilt, feeling powerless and having no voice. It starts with your rage. It needs to be expressed somehow to get to your pain, to get to what matters. But if codependents are conflict averse and people pleasers, there's no space for rage. There's no space for anger. If there's no space for rage and anger, then being devoiced continues. You're still silenced. Welcome, Nick. But we can't have that conversation if we don't talk about rage. When it's guided and directed, it allows us to reach the depths of our greatness. And when it's denied, it kills us. So this is the challenge of these groups when people get triggered of people jump on each other for being triggered and sharing too much rage. <laughs> All you're doing is continuing the family secrets. You're continuing the pattern of divorcing people and you're just setting up a new dysfunctional family of people playing pre play pretend and play cooperation with a lot of rules, a lot of secrets, a lot of silencing with the goal of containing everyone's rage because that's the only way to make everyone else predictable that was the goal of containing your abuser if you could contain the abuser's rage then that made your world safe and that starts with containing your rage and then shape-shifting to try to contain their rage because when they raged that means you're terrified with the their demeaning terrorism I need a better pointer for that. Shape shifting to contain rage. So what does that look like? Oh, we'll get to that in a minute. But this is Richard Grannon also sharing the pain. 
see if anybody sees the links. I'm talking about somebody who had their soul scooped out in childhood and something dark put in its place. The true codependent is absolutely entrained into a slave mindset and cannot know love through any other way. People like me, a true codependent, we are sick, sick, very, very sick people. Total addicts, total addicts. You see before you, not a man, I'm not a man. You see before you, not a human. I am the appearance of one. Oh, but you do a really good job. Well, I've been practicing since childhood. I'm here to fawn. I'm here to appease. My relationship with you, my followers, is completely codependent. My relationship with you, my followers, is completely codependent. It's codependent. It's a performance. It's a human performance. Is it good? I'm AI. I'm artificial intelligence. Are you impressed? Is this what you would imagine somebody of around my age would look like and talk like if they had their shit together? It, it is. Well, then I did my job, didn't I? I sold you the idea. I sold you the idea. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> That's sort of the performance. I sold you the idea. That's the goal. That's this family secret. You get into this mode of selling people the idea. So then... Oh. How do I set this up? Okay, this is from Tara's, Tara Westover's book, Educated. It's an example of one of the abuse, physical abuse stories that she's had from her brother, Sean. It is a bit graphic in the physical part, but um, no one got killed. There wasn't any blood. Maybe some bones got tweaked. But she's alive now, and she's a successful, best-selling author, and she's away from the family. So I don't think the brother got charged, so you guys can track him down and try to charge him if you get upset about the story. So Sean is the abuser. Tyler is a brother who comes in, and then Mom is there. This is only audiobook. Two hands were gripping my throat, and they'd been shaking me. The needles? That was my brain crashing into my skull. I had only a few seconds to wonder why before the needles returned, shredding my thoughts. My eyes were open, but I saw only white flashes. A few sounds made it through to me. Slut! Whore! Then another sound. Mother. She was crying. Stop! You're killing her! Stop! So she's getting strangled by her brother Sean, and Mom's there to watch. <laughs> she must have grabbed him, because I felt his body twist. I fell to the floor. When I opened my eyes, Mother and Sean were facing each other, Mother wearing only a tattered bathrobe. I was yanked to my feet. Sean grasped a fistful of my hair and dragged me into the hallway. My head was pressed into his chest. All I could see were bits of carpet flying past my tripping feet, my head pounded. I had trouble breathing. I tried to look at him, to search his face for my brother, but he shoved my head toward the ground, and I fell. I scrambled away, then pulled myself upright. The kitchen was spinning. Strange flecks of pink and yellow drifted before my eyes. So there's a struggle. She's losing oxygen. She's uh, being abused actively. Okay, But she survives. This is, always, this is her story she openly shares in her book. She's not moderating it, or she's not, it's not her voice though, but this is something that she shared publicly. Mother was sobbing, clawing at her hair. I see you for what you are. I see how you prance around with Charles like a prostitute. So right there is Sean defining, redefining Tara's story. That's the demeaning part. That's the gaslighting. He's doing it while she's under physical duress, that is the time to gaslight the person. That is where the gaslighting will stick. If you gaslight in this room where you're not triggered, you can say it to yourself 50 times, but it's not going to stick. It has to be done in a high emotional state. 
that's sort of why codependents are frustrated. They come here and they get all the validation. They say great rock and they're certain here in this group or in any other group or in the therapist's office. But then under the physical stress of the abuser, under the flood, under the overwhelm, where they're trapped in overwhelm and they feel hopeless and powerless, that gaslighting sticks. That redefining sticks. So you come here and get redefined. It doesn't matter. You aren't being triggered with fog. It's not going to stick. Unfortunately, psychoeducation only goes so far. He turned to mother to observe the effect of his words on her. She had collapsed at the kitchen table. She does not, mother whispered. Sean was still turned toward her. She does not, mother whispered. So who has a louder voice? Sean's screaming it with emphatic certainty. Mother is whimpering it, saying, oh, she does not. And eventually, mother's opinion, everybody else's opinion, gets erased. That's the divorcing. One person's rage <laughs> overrides everybody else's voice. <laughs> and then that rage of the victim gets turned inwards or turned somewhere else because it can't be acted out because she's physically getting beaten to a pulp. Or she's not getting beaten, she's getting wrestled and stuff. She's getting abused. He said she had no idea of the lies I told, how I'd fooled her, how I played the good girl at home, but in town I was a lying whore. The air poured from my lungs as I tried to bend deeper to give my wrist bone every possible inch of relief. Say it, he said. But I was somewhere else. I was in the future. In a few hours, Sean would be kneeling by my bed, and he'd be so very sorry. I knew it even as I hunched there. What's going so she's putting her mind into the future, <laughs> escaping the current reality and saying, Oh, Sean, after he goes through the rage, he comes back and he apologizes. I'm going to think about that now. What's going on? It was Tyler. I was hallucinating. Tyler never came home. As I thought that, I laughed out loud, a high-pitched cackle. There were now so many pink and yellow specks in my vision, it was as if I were inside a snow globe. That was good. It meant I was close to passing out. <laughs> it's like she's in a snow globe, which means she was about to pass out. So here's a tip for you. If you're in a strangulation contest and you feel like a snow globe, that's a good thing because you're about to pass out. This is a, a side tip from the book for people. <laughs> if you think you feel like you're in a snow globe, that's a good sign because you're about to pass out. I was looking forward to it. Sean dropped my wrist, and again I fell. What's going on? Tyler repeated. He eyed Sean, inching forward as if approaching a rattlesnake. Mother stopped crying. She was embarrassed. Tyler was an outsider now. He'd been gone for so long, he'd been shifted to that category of people who we kept secrets from. Mom is embarrassed because Tyler is home. Mom isn't happy that Tyler can stop Sean. Mom is embarrassed that Tyler is seeing the secret. This is how family secrets distorts norms. It's all about keeping the secret in house. <laughs> it's not about uh, growing, protecting, giving people help. It's about keeping things in a fog. Who we kept this from. Oh, and then here's a little bit of a follow-up part the only thing worse than being dragged through the house by my hair was tyler's having seen it given the choice between letting it play out and having tyler there to stop it i'd have chosen to let it play out there's another family secret twist given the choice of having tyler see it and rescue her she would prefer tyler didn't see it she would have passed out and forgot that was her preference instead of the secret getting out she preferred it would have stayed in-house and no one knew. Obviously, I would have chosen that. I'd been close to passing out anyway, and then I could have forgotten about it. But Tyler had seen it, had made it real. That's the issue. Tyler saw it. Somebody else saw it. It became real. 
once somebody else saw it, it became real. That means the secret's out, but all of her secret defenses and all this other stuff also has to be reevaluated. Her negative identity of fighting that has to be reformed. That's the, that's the negative. That's the challenge. So let's zoom out a little. Now we can introduce Jared Carmichael's video and people might be able to follow it better. In person, we just dumped that first and then people didn't really see it. So this is another example of family secrets. His is more subtle. It's about a lot of uh, husbands cheating and stuff. Right? And this situation is him where he came out gay and shared to his family. And some of the family member members gave him negative heat or hate or judgment. But his mom gave him nothing. And the mom giving him nothing hurt him more than the other family members who are actively giving him, like, ah, you should change or other feedback. Why does the non-response hurt more? Think about that question. seeing things, not seeing things, they, they just kind of existed with the secret. They, they knew, but they didn't know. It, 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 it's weird. I, it's like generations of that, generations of just seeing things, not seeing things. She thinks not. So you live in a fog of family secrets. Some things can be seen, some things aren't seen, and you're always in this uncertainty of what's allowed to be seen or not seen. And that makes it confusing to you because you're spending all this energy trying to navigate smoke and mirrors. Not reacting is the best reaction. She's been rewarded for um, staying quiet with her dad. So she gives me nothing, nothing. So codependents and enablers are rewarded for keeping the secrets up, being silent. That was his mom, rewarded for being silent. Reacting is the best reaction. Not reacting. Gray Rock is natural for her. She's a naturally avoidant dismissive, like Richard Grannon. She's been rewarded for um, staying quiet with her dad. So she gives me not the happy he's on his mother. You see a little bit of rage right there, but he can't express it fully because he's also a people pleaser. <laughs> he's also conflict averse, so the rage comes out sideways. Even hate starts to feel like love because that's acknowledgement. It's not just nice, it's not pleasant, it's real. I think that would feel better. Like, I, I wish you would yell at me, I wish you would tell me to not come home. Anything, anything, anything. She's nice. She's sweet. She ignores it. She ignores it. The worst of her is cold, like really, really cold. I mean, she's a nice lady, but like she can shut people out. She can ignore, she can block and like go inside. My last real secret is people think I'm nice. Like, nah, I'm like my mom, fuck everybody. <laughs> This is the dark side of codependence or narcissists. There's that self-centered focus of like, when it matters, fuck everybody. When I'm triggered, when I'm not happy, fuck everybody. I'm going to stick to stonewall of my story or who's a bad person or the scapegoat and fuck everybody. That's where if you want to know who has your back, you have to be in a situation where that person could say fuck everybody and see if that person has some principles. Then you know what they stand for. But if you're in a group and you're all play nice, that you can't tell. <laughs> very selfish. Very, 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 very selfish. 
I smiled. Very polite about it. I lied to everybody's face. Like, no, no, we should get dinner. <laughs> it's like my mom is that performance of like who you're supposed to be. Like I'm afraid of not smiling. I smile a lot. I'm afraid of things getting uh, awkward, like weird. Like even this moment, I'm like, all right, man, I should probably think of a joke. You know, like, it's just like falling apart out here, and it's like <laughs> I carry some guilt because I was complicit in the lie, I guess. I thought I was protecting her. I always felt like my mom's uh, protector, protector. That's another trap of family secrets. Once you're complicit in the lie, or a small lie, it's easy to be complicit in a bigger lie. And then now you feel extra guilty. <laughs> it's harder to call it out. You benefit, you benefited from being silent and keeping the secret. So it's easier to keep the status quo going. And then he's just living in this constant fog of distortion, lies, self brainwashing, self gaslighting. Another workshop to fool yourself, this constant self deception. When there's distance between me and my mom, it's the times when I feel the most like an orphan. I feel abandoned. I'm like an orphan. I feel abandoned. I'm so there he bleated out, he felt abandoned, but then he switched topics. That's why it was hard to catch. Because feeling abandoned, that's the fear of being abandoned. That's the terrorism of being exiled, socially exiled. That's what avoidance and di dismissives use to motivate people and motivate themselves. But it's invisible because they just disappear, they ghost you, or they just ignore you. But when they're there, they're all nice and whatever, but then whatever causes this flip, the switch to flip, they turn cold and then you're invisible. I've been trying to be very honest because my whole life was shrouded in secrets, shrouded in secrets. I figured the only route I haven't tried was the truth. So I'm saying everything. Feel okay? <laughs> so he's testing the waters of the truth, and then you see him looking outward because he's still scared. He's been programmed to be silent, but he needs to not only not get attacked for telling the truth, but also getting some sort of reflection back that it's okay. So he's still searching to be seen or to have the the loop of truth sharing or being honest and being honest to be reflected back. He hasn't gotten that. So he's he hasn't fallen apart yet after sharing. But he's still looking outwards. Is it okay? Is it okay? Let me test the waters. This is him setting boundaries, testing. Is it okay to share, to be honest? My whole life was shrouded in secrets. And then shrouded in secrets is a different body language. It's not looking outwards, it's looking down and away, because that's living in secrecy. That's family secrets. Resignation, maybe, that's good, yeah. Eight fifty-eight. How do I find a close for this? Hmm. Maybe secrets are a good thing. More secrets, the better. So here's a technique if you're in trouble. If secrets are coming out, you can go to a mirror and use uh, Tara's uh, tactic. I turned to mother, waiting for her to add her voice to mine, but she was silent. 
Her eyes were fixed on the floor, as if Dad and I were not there. There was a moment when I realized she would not speak, that she would sit there and... Oh, this is her mother. <laughs> Doesn't she look loving and caring? <laughs> say nothing, that I was alone. I tried to calm Dad, but my voice trembled, cracked. Then I was wailing. Sobs erupted from somewhere, some part of me I had not felt in years, that I had forgotten existed. I thought I might vomit. Sad baby came out in public. Big shame she's not supposed to cry in public. I ran to the bathroom. I was shaking from my feet to my fingers. I had to strangle the sobs quickly. Dad would never take me seriously if I couldn't. So I. So, if you're in need to strangle your sobs, this is her technique. Stopped the bawling using the old methods, staring my face down in the mirror and scolding it for every tear. It was such a familiar process that in doing it, I shattered the illusion I'd been building so carefully for the past year. The fake past, the fake future, both gone. I stared at the reflection. The mirror was mesmeric, with its triple panels trimmed with false oak. Mesmeric. It was the same mirror I'd gazed into as a child, then as a girl, then as a youth, half woman, half girl. I had often locked myself in this bathroom after Sean let me go. I would move the panels until they showed my face three times, then I would glare at each one, contemplating what Sean had said and what he had made me say, until it all began to feel true, instead of just something I had said to make the pain stop. And here I was still, and here was the mirror, the same face repeated in the same three panels. Except it wasn't. This face was older and floating above a soft cashmere sweater. I had regained a fragile sense of calm. Look at this slight twist of positive. <laughs> Is it enough? And I left the bathroom, carrying that calmness delicately, as if it were a china plate balancing on my head. But it's a very delicate stability. I walked slowly down the hall, taking small, even steps. I'm going to bed. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Look, she set a boundary. To her mother and dad, what happens? <laughs> dad was at his desk. We'll talk about it now. I told Sean what you said. He is coming. Sean comes. With a six inch knife blade. That's dripping of blood. He murdered his prize dog as a scapegoat example to tell Tara to keep her fucking mouth shut. <laughs> That's later in the book. This meeting is just to promote her book. <laughs> so... How do we close this? I guess you can't really close it. There's no magic fixes with family secrets. It's just slowly you need to fight for truth or find your voice. That's hard. Eh, okay, fine. <laughs> You have to slowly learn to live your truth. This is a bit of a jump. But this is one of my favorite uh, Peterson clips because his early ones that he cried. Most of your viewers will have watched Pinocchio. Probably. There's a scene in Pinocchio where Geppetto wishes on a star. Right, and what it means is he lifts up his eyes 
beyond the horizon to something transcendent, to something ultimate, because that's what a star is. It's, it's part of the, of the eternity of the night sky. And so he lifts his eyes up above his daily concerns and he says, what I want What, what I want more than anything else is that my creation will become a genuine individual, right? It's, it's a heroic gesture because it's so unlikely. And that catalyzes the puppet's transformation into a real being. And we start as puppets. So if you're living in family secrets and your life is a performance, you start as puppets. What's the way out? And so the trick is to get rid of your goddamn strings. And you remember in Pinocchio, he faces a lot of temptations. One is to be a liar. The other is to be a neurotic victim. There's nothing wrong with being a neurotic victim. You can say, where's the healing all the time? And everybody loves that. That's how he ends up in Pleasure Island, where he just about gets sold into the salt mines. Well, okay, so what you do is you lift up your eyes and you say, look, I would like being to progress in the best possible manner. And that's best for me, best for my family, best for society, maybe best for the world. Then you tell the truth. And then you can tell if you're telling the truth. You can tell it physiologically. So this is a good clue, and they don't really teach this much. But if I'm an abuser and want to disable you, I divorce you so you can't tell the truth. Or when you tell the truth and feel strong, I punish you. If you lose touch with your inner sensation of what's true and false, then now you're more susceptible to gaslighting. You're more susceptible to doubt. Anytime you share rage and you start speaking from your truth and say, fuck the world, this is what matters. I punish you, I judge you, I leave you, I smear campaign you, whatever, because my goal is to keep you a, a puppet, is to keep you from finding your truth, because your truth will make you feel strong. You watch what you say, and you will find out that some things you say make you come apart. They make you fall apart, they, and you can feel it. It's physiologically. It's centered in your. It's centered in your solar plexus. It's a feeling of chaotic weakness and dissolution. It's it's a sense of self betrayal. Sense of self betrayal. That's that's nice. So that's a good. Yeah. <laughs> when you lie to yourself and others, you feel the self betrayal. And then if you tell the truth, that pulls you together and strengthens you. And so you can learn to feel when your words are accurately articulating yourself. And then you practice that. And that makes you into the sort of person that won't be an Auschwitz guard, that won't play ideological games, that won't sacrifice other people to their expediency. He says that, that, that that's like a bad thing, so I have to backtrack and be Steven Pinker or something. What is wrong with sacrificing other people for your expediency? That's called, you know, Survivor. That's called all those competition games. <laughs> Kill everyone else off for your personal gain. That's what we're promoting in society now, so. I'm going to give some room to this other side of this because I like, uh, giving a balanced pre presentation and I want to feed your dark side so you can consciously choose to choose the path of truth not because Jordan Peterson promotes it or I'm promoting it but because it makes you feel more congruent so until you reach that point it's totally okay to sacrifice other people for your petty tiny cheap wins because you're a fucking loser but it's totally fine to <laughs> Use people for your expediency. I am totally advocating that. Damn, I didn't do that good. <laughs> She's advocating, so be scared of her if you try to find the truth. <laughs> A 
end of the year for the year. That's all, folks. <laughs> Unwanted identity is the most powerful elicitor of shame. Unwanted identity is the most powerful elicitor of shame. Unwanted identity is the most powerful elicitor of shame. Unwanted identity is the most powerful elicitor of shame. Why? Unwanted identity is the most powerful elicitor of shame. Unwanted identity is the most powerful elicitor of shame. Because that's when somebody else divorces you, defines your identity. But sometimes when you lie to yourself with the wrong ident identity, having a group to help balance out the reflection to get a more identity that's closer to your truth or to your emerging self, that's a benefit. But if you're, if you're playing the defined game, who can malign the other person's identity first? That sort of shell game. Then. Unwanted identity is the most powerful elicitor of shame. Unwanted identity is the most powerful elicitor of shame. Unwanted identity is the most powerful elicitor of shame. Unwanted identity. Welcome back, Ellie. We didn't get Sarah. We were waiting for the all session. <laughs> um, so that's the formal session over. Probably have to revisit, maybe. We'll see. Takeaways, someone rescue the people that missed stuff, be codependent. <laughs> Nobody's taking the bait. I'm sorry, you're not being helpful to me right now? being helpful to me right now i'm sorry you're not being helpful to me right now be more fucking constructive be more fucking constructive be more fucking constructive be more fucking constructive be more fu do something do something do something do something do something do something do i'm trying to have a conversation i'm trying to have a conversation I'm trying to have a conversation. I'm Someone took a head trip? <laughs> heavy? What was heavy? This was such a light, hopeful, positive conversation. <laughs> Secrecy is dangerous. People get killed for talking about secrets, yeah? It's really quiet right now. I just feel like I wanted to break the silence. Oh, welcome. Do you right? want to break it with song? Do you want to sing to Zoe? us or something? You can't handle the silence? <laughs> yeah, kind of tense. It's kind of tense, the silence. Hmm. It's a sign there's tension? Is it a sign there's danger? Do you think someone's gonna... Definitely. Rage out because there's too much silence? <laughs> What's going on there, Laura? Peace, yes. Peace. Right. Mm. But what if a lot of um, mental illness is because of family secrets? 
people are carrying the burdens of a lot of family secrets, uh, scapegoated, self-guilt, and then they get blamed or stigmatized with whatever label they get from mental health. But all those behaviors were adapted in the family secret mind fuck fog of that family <laughs> or that cult. It's not so adaptive in other sectors, in the real world and other relationships. So then it gets stigmatized with a label. But the issue is the family secrets, the scapegoating. The, it's not even a developmental disorder. It's more so it's an active active disabling or active uh, injury of children and other people in the pit, in the cult to devoice, to silence, to dehumanize, to break their spirit, to make them more uh, slaves to the cult family. So, all right, Dave, I'll give you some, here's some bait, okay. My borderline mother was able to do this to incredible effect. She kept a secret from me until I was 21 that she actually had a husband before my father. So I didn't realize that she'd been married once before until my 21st birthday. And she managed to keep that. She kept that under wraps through all the family and all the friends. Everybody kept it under wraps. It was quite something. And when I found out about it, I freaked the fuck out. I said, what else are you keeping from me? And there were other things. It was very clever. Um, but when I when I mentioned it, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, your mother was married to someone else before. But did you know that then they actually swapped around? So your father's ex-wife married your mother's ex-husband? And then that secret came out. That secret came out later. So we got oh. two, two for one. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and she kept the secret from you of everybody else who knew about yeah, it. Yeah, she managed to she managed to control not only she kept it from me, but she managed to control everybody around to shut the fuck up about it because it was a it was a such a hot potato. Yeah, Very shut cool. the fuck up up, up yeah, about shut it. Shut the fuck yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> But what's funny, now that the cat's out of the bag, I challenged her once a while ago, and she was completely fine about it. Oh, yes, you know, nothing to see here. It was just Barry. What difference does it make? <laughs> really good pivot, 180 degrees. Oh, you know, change Barry. topics, pivot, yeah. Oh, well, worth a shot. <laughs> so you had the family secret come out, and then you felt... Oh, betrayed. betrayed yeah complete betrayal because then you realize what else the first thing he goes else is what what else aren't you telling me and then the rest of it is who the fuck am i and who are these people and and i felt quite foolish because i'm thinking oh this is how this all comes together because there was a half brother and a half sister and uh, and all sorts of stuff and it just turned into this ridiculous melodrama that i look back at now and go uh, you know, it's all a bit pedestrian, really. So, yeah, it was actually a control mechanism of hers to protect her ego. Well, after you found out the, the, the secret, then you're like, oh, who am I? Who is everybody else? So it's very disorienting. Yeah, yeah just slightly. <laughs> so, <laughs> this guy's my father. When did you meet him? And, you can, and to this day, I still there's still missing pieces of the story. I mean, I've given up on it, um, but there's still missing pieces of the story. Uh, and she's my, she has a she has a much younger brother that is quite sensible. And I've said to him, "Do you remember when this was all going down?" And he said to me, "All I remember, Brad, was I was 16, being driven around in the back of a car, and there was a lot of screaming. <laughs> That's it. There was a lot of screaming." Yeah, so a very clever little campaign she's waged. Well, it's a clever campaign, but it's just to 
keep you off balance, that sort of... Uh... Yeah, it serves no real purpose other than that. Or it protects Well, that's her. the purpose. That's a big purpose. I think, I think it also helped her maintain a certain image because of her narcissism. She needed to be seen as this perfect woman that had never been married before. Uh, and a failed marriage, I think, was a great sense of shame to her. So it managed her shame, but also managed her... Um, so it's for her image, and then your feelings came second. So the truth would help you make sense of the chaos. But her selfishness of keeping that secret was a betrayal to you because you had a right to know. So you then when you finally found out, you like, who am I? Who is everyone else that flooded you? Yeah, there were a number of these... Uh, there is a number of telltale signs that I didn't quite pick up, but as soon as I found out, the pieces all fell, most of the pieces fell into place. Did you ask her why you were born six months after she got married? Oh, no, I was, um, no, I jo well, I joined <laughs> those dots. Uh, there's a timeline. You, you can join the dots on that one. No, she was, um, she, I think she was married to the other guy when she fell pregnant with me, and I think I think that's what happened. But you're talking 1966, 1967, it's so it's a long time ago. And Australia was very conservative, so you had to go and hide, and you know the shame and all that sort of all that sort of stuff. Um, but the interesting thing, Eagle, was my father's family for the first 15 years of my life kept accidentally referring to me as Lyle, which is my half brother's name. And it was all this, oh, there's Lyle. Oh, I mean, Brad. And I thought, who the <laughs> fuck is Lyle? Why are you doing this? Yes. And of course, there they she hated my mother. They Radar. hated my mother because she was, yeah, she was a second, she was a second wife. So they called her Val, which was my father's first wife's name, accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> they were such bastards. <laughs> anyway. It started to unravel. We're heading home on one evening. I said, why do the Kellys keep calling me Lyle and why do they call you Val? And she turned around and said, because they're assholes. <laughs> and that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> and it's the last time I saw them. So there you go. So more secrets and secrets. And my half-brother actually turned up on the doorstep when I was about 10 and knocked on the door and I didn't know who he was. Who are you? I'm Lyle. I'm your half-brother. I sort of say yes. But again, you're right, Dave. It kept me on my toes and kept me under control. That was the, that was the whole, the really underlying motive. Well, well, no, you're an accessory. The secret wasn't about you; it was about her selfishness, right? Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, there was a half sister too. Yeah, so that she emerged. Yeah, so it helped her. It kept her from having to explain everything to you. It kept her appearances up. But then you were confused because you got the name, different names, and all this other stuff. And then she the also didn't like it, were. I'm sure. Yeah, I didn't know who the fuck these people were. Mm -hmm. So then your disorientation of where you fit in your family system creates a sense of doubt. So then when you go into the real world, you also have a, a disease and uncertainty of navigating or being hypersensitive to betrayal. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I can sense it. I, my spidey senses, uh, mm -hmm. can, um, uh, can, uh, can sense that pretty easily. But it's interesting mm -hmm. now that I see it in the rear view mirror, many, many years later, She's now 80, I'm 55. It kind of, it's sort of like, you see it as a bit of a silly soap opera and just a bit comical. And now that she's declining, well, I spoke to her a number of years ago and I challenged her on it. She just giggled and laughed. <laughs> it's, it's irrelevant. So it's the secret served their purpose. Oh. Well, it served her image purpose. The secret doesn't have to be a massive motivation. It's sort of like a slippery slope. You choose a path of deception, self-deception, secrets, and then that adds on or roller coasters, snowballs. And then it gets out of control. 
Yeah, and then she everyone lost... in a sort of helpless to the out of control secrets. Yeah, she lost control of the secret one afternoon with a fa- along with with her oldest friend, who she had to exile because that friend and her husband called her on it. She was trying to say, "I've only been married once." And her friend June said, no, I was at the first wedding, Rayleigh. What are you talking about? <laughs> so she'd forgotten who had the story and, 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 and June had to be banished. So that was, that was how that was dealt with. <laughs> she forgot. Well, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with all the secrets or the lies. Tragic or not? Not really. So, what did people think about Jared Carmichael's video clip? Did people find that genuine? Was that heart opening to hear his pain? Or did you think he was splitting in bipolar? That was one person's reaction from in person. <laughs> I mean, his whole comedy piece was an hour, so I punched it down. There are longer gaps between the reveals. Well, I thought so. it was pretty honest. I couldn't see any bipolar splitting or anything. Mm-hmm. Because we dumped it onto Sophia with any sort of... Actually, I tried to give her a heads up, but I told Sue to give a heads up. And then Sue's heads up, our opener was terrible. <laughs> Igor was there for in person. Right. That's where I sort of had to back up from the meeting because I wasn't expecting such uh, foggy response to to that clip. Diving into family secrets is a very touchy subject. Kelly's typing. Sorry. <laughs> Sounded like Kurt when he types. Kurt thumps on the keyboard. That was more delicate. <laughs> Need a louder keyboard so it's noticeable. More noticeable. So who, who can summarize the chat? Laura is describing teenage sister or someone hair was peeking mm. and beat her by a year and then Tell me you have something yeah How, how's my volume I'm, I'm through my speaker and my computer pretty okay. good no i just seem to have some things in common with kelly's sister who oh. who tried who tried to blow out family secrets by being rebellious and you know activating the firemen and if you're thinking about the ifs language like, you know, let's let's just like bring all the attention to this crazy behavior. Somebody is eventually gonna get counseling, right? Uh, I did eventually, but anyway, that's it. That's all. I don't want to go into details, right? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> because of the secrets. <laughs> so one person acts out as a scapegoat or the actor outer, and then that person has to process the feelings? Is that the... Has to find somewhere else to be. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> but they're not your secrets, so who cares? What are they? Yeah, they're your family secrets. Oh, they're still alive. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, if they're secrets, you can't... You have to navigate through them. There's a a lingering effect of being in a family of secrecy. A long-term effect. That's sort of the, an invisible long-term effect of being in uh, growing up with secrecy. That's where it's hard to talk about, and it's hard to illustrate the invisible long-term effects of living in. 
will silence voices or unacknowledgement of things that are right in front of your face. My situation is more so that I had family secrets from uh, martial law in Taiwan. So then my family was more silent because if you talked about politics or other stuff, neighbors could share that and then you, family could get arrested or disappear. So there is this constant paranoia or self-silencing. But I don't remember because I was only in Taiwan for one year. But then the lingering effects that my mom grew up in that martial law. You don't talk about stuff. So that a lot of stuff just wasn't... There's an absence of Chinese history, Taiwan history, and this absence of stuff. And then I sort of sense there's an absence, but I don't know why. Not as dramatic or precise as Brad's family secrets, but even then... Just because of the mom's marriage and all that stuff, those are the easy family secrets to spot. But the other things that aren't talked about, that are holes in memory or holes in things, that, that also has an effect. Maria is sorry she had an emergency. She has to go. We must let her apologize because it's horrible that she's leaving because of an emergency. We are very judgmental. <laughs> it's a Zoom call. People come and go. It's fine. We'll try not to do anything super exciting when you're gone. We'll wait till you come back. That's hard to promise. But... <laughs> Do secrets prevent you? Secrets meaning like family secrets or secrets created prevent you or get in the way of being authentic in your life, like putting out your authentic self. Well, if you grew up in a family and there were secrets and that was normal, a lot of, if you shared your authentic self, it would be ignored. You'd have these subtle hits. If your authentic self dived into secret territory, you would get rejected or overreacted. So you would condition yourself to to fit a certain mold because of the family secrets. So then you weren't witnessed and allowed to be authentic, so outside of your family, then yes, it would be hard to to be real, to be authentic. Even when we have pointers that say, be real, that's an injunction. <laughs> Why can't you be real? And also that's, that can also come from a place of uh, performing. I think Bradshaw said something like, yeah, the one thing you don't have to work on is being yourself. So that if you're asking, <laughs> am I authentic? <laughs> Am I real enough? <laughs> Is this me? That's not you being yourself. That's you <laughs> trying to perform <laughs> yourself. <laughs>